Uh, many of you in the club know me as the guy who likes to do multiple things, likes to do repetition. I grew up in a, a manufacturing environment where we had to reproduce and replicate, make it the same constantly for our customers. So it was really important that we did it the same. So uh, with that, uh, you'll also see guys like Lyle Jamison. If you go out to his website or any of his YouTube videos, he makes the comment that with his hollowing system, Lyle Jamison makes the uh, uh, captive boring bar method of hollowing. And he said, uh, when you get this, if you buy it, get it. Make sure you do at least 10 before you can feel comfortable with it. And other symposiums I've been to has said, the best thing you can do is make replications. You learn a lot by trying to reproduce what you did. We can use the excuse that it drives me crazy to make replications. You know, I, I like to let the wood tell me what to do. And the comment that one of the pro turners said was, either you're hard of hearing or that wood isn't talking very good. <laughs> so put some thought into it. And, and that's what I try to do to give it some uh, dimension. So on the production side, what I want to show you is very seldom today do I use a bandsaw for rounding out a bowl blank. And uh, why? I find it faster, safer. I don't have to worry about those chunks of wood <laughs> The chips I can get rid of. People like them for landscaping, but you know the rest of the stuff has to is waste that has to go into a fire pit. So what I'll I'll show you how I do it. Don't use the jam chuck. I use the face of the jaws. Uh, this is a talon jaw. I also have a stronghold that I'll use at home, and I'll run the jaws out to just about just under the diameter that I want to create. That allows me to take this square blank and use the jaws to make sure that I'm centered in it. I'm not going to take a compass and draw a circle around it. I use the face of the jaws. It gets me as accurate as you need to be. Does that make sense? Are you following what I'm saying on that? Um, I'll, you'll see it a little bit clearer when I do the lid for the box, how I use the jaws to help me shape the bowl. The other thing is uh, talking about roughing a square. Uh, Lyle and I had a conversation about it uh, last a week or so ago that um, most of us to round off a uh, square blank will uh, I should, pardon me I better grab a face mask just to be just to be legal you can hear me okay all right so what uh, most people will do is put a square on it to turn around And I'll start at one side and start taking a little bit and it's tick, 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 tick. And I keep going across. And that's wood turning 101. And in about half an hour, you'll have a round piece. <laughs> it's not that bad, but it's slow. What, you, what I've found through the help of others uh, is that if I just go into the side of the wood, here what's happening is I'm cutting end grain, Long grain, end grain, long grain. That's why it's kind of got a, a rhythm to it. I don't want to do that. If I go into the side, I'm cutting the same fibers, but it acts like I'm cutting long grain. Does, that make, does everyone know what I mean by long grain, end grain? So it's a smoother cut. It's a cleaner cut. I'm not going to get this chip out that you can get by that ka-chunky, chunky, chunky, chunky. Uh, so let me demonstrate that. I'll put my tool rest at about a 45 degree angle to the corner. Make sure you rotate it a couple of times so that you have clearance before you put power to it. We'll put that on. I can see as it's spinning, uh, I don't know if the camera will show it, but there's a, a ghost image. I can see where there's solid wood and where the uh, corners are. So I'm going to go close to where it's solid wood. Okay, so now you, you hear that I'm not getting the ka-chunka, chunka, chunka. I'm hoping.
holding back because I don't want to show off and do it real fast because that's always when something goes wrong. But, but you get the idea that you're not hearing any of the clunking. You've got total control of your tool by, when you're doing it this way. And honestly, that's probably how I do 100% of my goals today. I came from the other side because I don't get a chance of blowing the wood out and taking a big chunk out of it. And the old craftsman method of laying your tool on top of it. If you're not getting any bounce, you're round. If I had a, if I had a flat spot on it yet, you can see how my, you can hear it and see that my tool is bouncing. So I'll take a little bit off of that. So again, on a manufacturing reproduction standpoint, I don't want to stop and have to look at it. You know, and turn it on again, turn it off again. So that gets me that there real fast. Uh, the other thing that I've, I've learned over the years is that what I want to do is uh, think about each step in the process and plan for it. So what I'm going to start out doing is uh, I'll get one here to show you the, uh, the process here. Uh, what I'm going to do not all smokers have this lip on it, if you were to go out on, on the internet. But I need that, that's going to be a fixture for me, for making the rest of the piece. So, uh, some of my customers said, I made that comment, is that okay? And he said, oh yeah, I like it. it. It centers up on the glass really well. I don't have to worry about it falling off. It, it works, so they, they really like that. So I continue to do that, but it is, it is strategically done. So what I'm going to do is I will uh, take this down to where it's uh, a little bit larger than I need. So currently that little shoulder piece is about an inch and three eighths. So I'm going to go to about an inch and a half. The reason I'm going to do that is that's going to be a fixture. I'm going to chuck it. I'm going to put some teeth marks in that. So one of my final steps is I want to turn it down one last time before it's finished and take those teeth marks out. So I'm gonna just roughly go to about two and a, two and a half, honey. How thick is that piece gear that you got on the road? Good question, Mark. Uh, this is black cherry lumber. I buy it direct from the sawmill. Cherry is currently going for anywhere from six to, I think uh, I've seen it as high as $10 a board foot. A board foot is, a 12 by 12 by 1 inch thick. This is 2 inch lumber. So you have to double that if you were going to buy a square foot of it. So uh, roughly $10 a linear foot if you wanted something that was about, what I buy is I look for something that's about 10 inches wide and standard 8 feet length. From the mill that I buy it from, that's about a $100 board, roughly. So. Um, it's, you can buy it at Home Depot. They don't stock it, they'll bring it in for you. I just looked this morning, so I had the right number to tell you. It's a two by four by eight in black cherry. What it doesn't tell me is the actual dimensions. If you like, when you buy a two by four, it's what, three and a half by inch and a quarter, you know, so $80 for that. So. And why do I do cherry? I like cherry, I like the way it turns, I like the way it finishes. Um, you can make it out of anything. So, uh, but two inches thick, and the point I wanted to make, Mark, on that final question was, I make sure that it's, it's close to perfect two, and a, two inch. I run it through a planer so that I know that it's two inches and that'll make some sense in just a minute when I get into boring the hole. All right, any other questions while we're up? All right, then I'm going to turn that shoulder real quick. <laughs> Again, I 
I'm cutting all long, uh, I'm cutting the long grain short grain, but when I go in from the side, it handles just like it was long grain. It just cuts like butter that way. And then a plunge cut. Everything pretty close there. Move it a bit. So that I'm uh, consistent in my teaching, I'm going to, I want to make sure that that shoulder is as close to a 90 degree as possible. Uh, I've been to uh, symposiums where the discussion about chucks has been just very much stressed. And they say that the jaws of the chuck, where my wood is touching, has about well, let me back up and say that the pressure of squeezing the tenant here with the jaws only accounts for about 60% of the holding power. It's the face of the jaws that give it the other 40% to keep it from flying out. Uh, if any of you have ever tried to put a broom hand or just something round into your chuck and start turning it, and all of a sudden it goes across the room, that's because you do utilize the physics of that right angle. So what I've, what I've been told in the, the classes I've been to is shoot for 90 degrees or if you're going to err, err on the side of a slight concave or a few degrees in so that the furthest point of your jaws contact the wood. Whereas if you went the other direction, your jaw face would, would touch here but the airspace over here. So a little bit like that is better than the other way. Does that make sense to everyone? All right, so I don't know. You don't have a screw in the chuck. You're just using just jam, 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 jam I'm just using the face of the jaws. Yeah. And Most of the stuff I turn, I think, has too much pork on it to get away without the screw. Okay. I and will, this, this is different. I will say that that's where the planing of it helps. By having a nice flat uniform surface. If there's any irregularities to it, yeah, yeah it can bounce. So again, like I say, my my joy, the, the passion, the joy that I get out of doing this is being able to replicate and doing it efficiently and expedient. Not fast, you know, that's that's not the right word, but I just like to be able to get on it and have predictability. So I'm just gonna use this uh, now I'm just going to make sure my corner is nice and clean. As simple as that. All right. So now I'll take it off that jaw face, and I'm going to turn it around. I asked specifically for this lathe so that I had a talon chuck because this design is kind of around a talon chuck. Now I don't know if you use the Nova chuck with my dimensions. I've never tried it with the Nova chuck to see if it would work. But I know this one, I've got enough squeeze, a compression on this tenant, and when I turn it around and do an expansion, and you'll see that in a minute, I have enough with my enough reduction in the jaws that I can expand it out to hold that. All right. So now what I'll do is uh, start out, and I'm going to bore the top hole that fits the screen. I'm uh, not a purist, so I use a force in a bit. Could I do it with a tool? Absolutely, if you want to. Uh, I use a force in a bit. What I will do is utilize the, uh, the scale that's on your quill. I'm going to set that to one inch. And uh, I'm going to bore it down one inch. So again, here again is why I want to make sure I'm two inches, because if I'm going to bore from one side one inch, I'll bore from the other side with a smaller bit, and it uh, works out nice. Does it have to be? If this was an inch and a quarter, I could go deeper, I could, but it just works for my repetition type of thing. So what I'm going to do... How big a diameter is that bit? Uh, that is an inch and a... Two and an eight? <laughs> Sure, Roger. It's two and an eighth. <laughs> All right, so... Um, is that important to the size of it? Or? It's yeah. important to the size of it because if it was smaller, your screen wouldn't fit in. 
Oh, that's just if it was tight. bigger, the screen might wobble more okay. than I wanted to for just the craftsmanship standpoint. Okay? And they're readily available, not cheap. What is Cost-wise? Wow, well, 30 bucks? No, I mean nothing. Is yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. All right, so I've got my quill set to the one inch, and then I will just go in and push my tailstock in until I start contacting wood so that I know my one inch is to the one inch. So I'm going to just bore that down. I'm going to problem just a smaller way. that they couldn't be, but I like, uh, I like a bag of chips that's nice and consistent. <coughs> I'm not going to touch it. <laughs> I know that it would be hot. Do I smoke it? Uh, depends on how dry your wood is. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, if you're getting smoke, it might be steam, the, the heat and the moisture in the wood more than smoke. But if you're burning it, um, you know. You get golf. You get hot. What's that? You get golf. You get hot. Yeah. All right. So I got my top hole done. At this point, what I'll do is uh, I'm going to. Fred, where did you put my key? It uh, wasn't in my new duties as a sign. <laughs> but um, is it? It's warm. You know. I, just, uh, just uh, sharpening foresters, I know it's a completely different topic. And yeah, just, you know, I've tried, yeah. and I've had reasonable success, but I'll have, I think, what do we say, a $30, I'll probably have $30 worth of time and not have a, a decent bid. I mean, might as well just go buy a new one. Notice on this one, uh, another learned from my experience. They don't hold up well when you drop them. <laughs> Snap the tang right off of it, but uh, luckily it still fits into the chuck. I'm, I'm just going to prep this for my second step here. Uh, all right, so now at this point, like I say, what I would do is uh, I might take a broom and sweep the floor up or push it off to the side, because now I'll start taking out the chips that I want to save. And what I'm going to do is begin shaping this down. Uh, the design of it is just something that worked for me. Um, I kind of like the, kind of look like a top hat, what was, I, what I was going for. I'm also thinking that these are some of uh, the local bars not, and non-local bars have bought these from me to offer to their customers a smoke train. I like the little tapered deal, it's easy to pick up. The, the top on it also has that similar taper to kind of tie it all together so it comes off real well. Um, there's a lot of them out there on the internet that are just straight down and over. I don't know, if you're selling something, I like to sell the craftsmanship behind it. All right, so this is a little bit of a freehand deal now. What I'm going to do, I'm gonna leave that a little bit thick, but I'm going to start taking some material away. Again, I'm going into <coughs> that face wood. It just, it turns the easiest.
can. I'm just going to, now I have all those little strollers that I created as I took the wood down, and I'll just clean those up. So I've got that shape close to what I want, and I'm going to, as long as I'm here and it's spinning, I'm going to take that, put that little bit of a chamfer or angle down on the side. Take that short corner off. Okay, so I've got the shape, I've got the center of the whole board. Now what I'm going to do is to um, turn it around and I'm going to do an expansion of my jaws. So I'm going to bring it all the way. So this is where I said the talon chuck works well for me. If you were going to use, if you, you have a Nova or a different brand of chuck, uh, make the hole whatever is the minimum that it slips over the co collapsed jaws. Mark. I'm going to be careful not to put too run. much pressure on that so I run. blow it out, but it hasn't happened yet. It always happens on a demo. So, um. All right. <laughs> so I know that I'm one inch down, so I'm halfway through. So I'll go with another portion of it before Roger asked me. That one is an inch and three quarter. All right. A similar thing, I set my quill at one inch just so I know uh, what, what I can expect. I touch the wood to make sure I begin to cut. There's a little mist there. Uh, I don't know if it's smoke or if it's uh, the moisture in the wood, but I'm turning pretty fast to a point of this. clean up some of this. Uh, I was done with this. If uh, this was totally finished, I could go back now and just take off any jaw teeth marks that would have been on that tenant. I'm going to clean it up and hit it with a little bit of sandpaper. Um, Pretty much what it takes to uh, to make the body. Uh, what I'll do then is I'll go with uh, at least two uh, uh, grits of sandpaper. Typically, I'll start out with uh, 80, depending on how quickly I was. Um, looking good today, I'm going to start with a 120, and I do it pretty quick. I just um, go into it.
some of the uh, pro demonstrators talk about sanding and they say whatever speed you turn the wood, sand at about half of that speed. Uh, and the reason for that is strictly it generates heat at a high speed, it's uncomfortable. It doesn't necessarily say that it's going to sand better or worse or more efficiently. It's just that it's All right, now I did do a, uh, I missed a kind of a step there. What I would do before I cleaned up that step is, um, I'm looking for the chuck hiding there, right? Uh, before I were to clean up that, that really should have been the last one. I'll, I'll put a finish on this part of it before I move on. But I'll just show you that real quick. Can you show us the interior of it? Yep. Okay, that's what I was seeing. Yep, so the shoulder. And uh, that might create a roughness as it blows through, but I don't really care because the screen's going on top of that. All right, so go back to the, the step before, when I was on, at this point before, I would have done the sandpaper. Uh, Kind of took any marks off that just to get a uniform finish. Soften the corners up. That was 120. I'll uh, I'll go down to 150 and just call that good. All right. Okay. So one of my uh, personal. Uh, Secrets is is what I use for a finish on something like this. Uh, I make my own finish through input from others that uh, I've done demos on. What I buy is carnauba wax flakes, and you can get it on Amazon. Uh, so carnauba wax is the hardest natural wax that nature produces. It comes from the leaves, the fawn leaves of a palm tree in Brazil. Uh, one of the, it works really good because of being the hardest wax, it's often used for casting, like for a jeweler who's gonna make a diamond ring or something, we'll use carnauba wax to create the thing, they will put it into a sand mold as the hot molten metal that's poured in, the wax goes out in that. Uh, but it's really too hard for a lot of what we want to do. Uh, you can, I've had solid canuba blocks. You drop it on the floor, it's like shattered glass. It's pieces everywhere. So what I do is, I, I actually buy these, what are they, I think they're take-alongs by Glad. <laughs> uh, you can buy them fairly inexpensively at grocery stores or wherever. I'll fill it half full of the canuba flakes, and then I'll bring it up to near the top with uh, Mahoney oil, walnut oil. Now I'll put this in the microwave, but I'm going to be careful about it. I'm going to only put it in for short iterations and check it and watch it. And it takes a little while because the, the oil is going to get hot, but the carnauba wax doesn't have the moisture content to melt on its own. So you're heating up the oil to melt the wax, so you can overheat the oil. Anyway, just take your time. It takes a while. The biggest secret on this, and I'm sharing this because it was my biggest learning curve, is if you took that out, now it's the wax is melted, the oil is hot, it's all one fluid now, and let that dry, it'll dry as a brick. It'll be hot.